And thanks very much, everyone, for joining. Uh, great to see so much interest on a Friday afternoon. Um, much appreciated. Um, I'm afraid there are going to be slides, which I'll put up now. I'm also slightly nervous in as much as I forgot my power cable. Uh, so we'll see whether or not my laptop lasts the entire webinar. Um, so, yeah, my name is Neil Jacobs, and I am the head of the UKRN's Open Research Programme. Uh, and I'll say, obviously, be saying quite a lot about that in due course. Uh, my my background is uh, that I spent a, a fair amount of time at, at an organisation, an organisation called JISC in the UK, uh, which is a sort of digital infrastructure um, uh, organisation focused very much on open research, and open access. And then I spent a couple of years in uh, in the major UK research funder, UKRI, and I've been in the UK government and other places as well. But really delighted to be with UKRN now, uh, running this programme, among other things. Uh, so this is what we're going to cover, assuming my laptop survives the entire time. Um, so I'm going to split the split the session into two. Uh, one, we're going to talk a little bit about so why open research and, and some of the context for the program um, and therefore how the program is designed. And then we'll have a little Q&A about that. Uh, and then we'll have a break where I might go and try and find a power cable. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the program itself uh, and some of the aspects of the program. And, and I'll end up by saying a little bit about how you might want to get involved. Um, so. When we come to the q and A, I'll probably will ask people to put their hands up. I'm not sure I can sort of speak and monitor the chat at the same time. Sorry about that. So it will be um, using those raise hands function when we get to the Q&A. Um, so I hope that's OK. So let's crack on. Uh, why, why open research? Um, now, I'm assuming that most of you will have your own thoughts on this. Uh, and uh, But I did want to take the opportunity of just sort of reflecting back some of the thoughts that I've had in running the program for the past year or so uh, and in having conversations with lots of extremely clever people about this over that period of time. Um, and one of the things that we've done is that the UKERN started to think about what we mean by, well, I guess what we mean by rigor and re reproducibility, really. I mean, reproducibility has a very narrowly technical definition in some ways, but we want to take a step back from that to look at this sort of a definition where we're thinking about research being sufficiently transparent and rigorous that somebody can really follow the steps that a researcher took or a research team took to reach the, the research conclusions that they did. And, and in order to follow those steps, the research not only needs to be rigorous and well done, but it also needs to be transparent. Uh, and I think that sort of way of thinking about reproducibility is, is quite helpful and quite widely applicable across a whole range of different kinds of research fields and settings and contexts and so on. And so what does that mean for, for open research? Now, um, you'll notice an acrostic emerging as I, I step through this slide. Um, it's a bit cute, and I'm sorry about that. Why open research? Well, firstly, culture. I'm, I'm going to make a case or make an argument, I think, that um, openness, transparency can, if it's done well, promote a, a culture of continual improvement. So there is, in some places, Sometimes within the research, uh, a, a, something about a, a nervousness about admitting honest mistakes. We know that retractions carry a huge amount of stigma in many, many disciplines. But what we want to move towards, I think, is a culture where, you know, that's not the case. We, where honest mistakes are, are noted uh, and corrected, and that's fine, and that's, you know, re in a sense, rewarded. But that can only really happen, I think, where we've got a, a, a culture of transparency and openness and um an acceptance that that is just that's just how research works of course it is um links i think the openness enables productive engagement with with societal actors with other knowledge systems so the kinds of transparency that we're talking about here where you can follow the reasoning follow the evidence follow the ways in which conclusions were drawn does enable others from outside of the academic world to engage much more constructively and much more fully, I think, with the kinds of research that goes on within the academic sector. I think there's an efficiency argument. Um, so this is well rehearsed. Aspects of research can be reused. Uh, they can re be reused by other researchers, by, by you six months later when you um, need to, to go back and, and reuse that piece of code or reanalyze that piece of data. And of course, by, by others outside of the sector. 
I think there's a measure of accountability here. Um, the degree of transparency that we're talking about can provide some assurance that what's mainly public money um, in academic research is being is being well spent, uh, and you know that that is transparent and visible that that is the case. And then finally, but certainly not uh, not the least important, is rigor. And I think the source of transparency and openness that we're talking about enables and encourages checks. Now, there's, there's, there's quite interesting thinking about this. I've been talking to people about the differences in which, differences in which um, sort of quality control happens. So in commercial research, of course, quite often the, the quality controls, the quality assurance are within the organization. An organization, a commercial company will have uh, so lots of testing, lots of review for its R&D uh, processes within the organization. But in academic research, that isn't normally uh, the way that we do things necessarily. Uh, normally, we publish or release or disseminate uh, for our peers in the wider community to, to, to review. Uh, and that is that level of transparency at the collective level across the sector, across the research system, that is the way in which science and research becomes well, self-correcting, if you want to use that phrase. So you can see a, a little acrostic that's uh, appeared there down the left-hand side. So that's why open research, and you can really boil this down to two things, I think, which is nullius and verba, you'll know that is the uh, strap line of the Royal Society, take no one's word for it. We're not talking about trust, we're talking about transparency, we're talking about evidence. Um, and show you're working show uh, you're working as as the research is done um, and of course there, there are all sorts of issues around that um, but we'll come around to that shortly there's a huge policy context many of you will be aware of that uh, internationally the unesco open science recommendation last year which i think is a fantastic document and, and brilliantly broad in the ways that it conceptualizes open science thinking about open scientific knowledge infrastructures engagement and dialogue with other knowledge systems and with other societal actors outside of outside of uh, the academic sector, which I think is a really helpful framing for open research. The European Commission uh, thinks about open science in these sorts of terms, so publishing, fair data, education skills, rewards, incentives, all those good things. Uh, and if that's the international context, then the national context in the U United Kingdom perhaps is best framed by the, the UK Research and Development Roadmap from two or three years ago produced by the government. And you'll see here, interestingly, in the minimising bureaucracy sort of part of that roadmap, uh, it's interesting that it's in that part, we must embrace the potential of open research practices. So right at the heart of government, uh, of government strategy, open research is right there. And they're talking about incentivizing open data sharing, digital software, data sets, and you're talking about enabling reproducibility and sharing knowledge. So that's right at the heart of government. And unsurprisingly, you'll then see that reflected in some of the strategies from our major funders uh, is the, the UKRI strategy, open research right at the heart of that. Um, and it's in some of our sort of collective agreements in the UK. We we have a set of concordats, and we know that there's quite a lot of work going on, on on the concordats at the moment, but there's at least two and probably more that talk about openness and transparency in research as being an expectation and something that all actors in the system have got a, a role to, to, uh, to enhance. But is it always open? And is it always the same kind of open? Well, obviously not. So is, is research always open? Well, we can imagine the world where it, where it is, where right from the very start, whether it's a historian in an archive or a, or a biomedical researcher in a lab, open their notebook, their digital notebook, and as notes are taken, as the research emerges, as the evidence is compiled, those things are made open straight away, and, and, it, and you can follow the research as it happens. So you know, in one way, that's right at one end of the spectrum, but there's all sorts of reasons why that is very difficult. So as open as possible and as closed as necessary is the, the mantra um, that the European Commission coined, I think, but is an extremely helpful way of framing uh, open research. National security, of course, is one issue that we, we run up against. In some cases, research can't be open because it would threaten national security. It might threaten the security of researchers in, in some cases to be as transparent as we might otherwise want to be, or of the vulnerable communities with whom we work or the animals that we're studying. Uh, and so on. 
There are also, uh, uh, you know, personal data issues. Of course, there are, uh, especially but not only in social sciences. And there's the whole area of IP protection and commercialization. So there may well be uh, boundaries to navigate there. And all of these, if you like, are, are boundaries or are, are negotiations that we need to, to make if we're going to be as open as possible in research, but as close as necessary. And it's difficult to sort of draw up uh, uh, sort of set obvious sets of principles that that manage all of these negotiations in all cases. Um, but I think, you know, we could probably do with some more work on, on how best to, to make those sorts of negotiations. But there are other sort of barriers to, to being open. So limited resources, lack of incentives, lack of community norms, unclear policies, all, all also prevent research being as open as it might otherwise be. But of course, those things, the ones in red here, are things that we've got some control over. And so, you know, I'm going to come back to those later in the talk to think about how we might begin to change some of those sort of barriers or, or, or restrictions or constraints. So, no, not always open, not always fully open for all sorts of very, very good reasons. And it, open looks different. Of course, it looks different. One of the first, <coughs> excuse me, one of the first things that I wanted to do when I joined UKRN is really sort of set out some of the differences that, that do exist across different disciplines with respect to open research. And so we now have sets of case studies, and I really appreciate those who worked on those case studies and sets of resources drawing from work from done by the University of Surrey initially to, to set out what open research looks and feels like and what sorts of resources are available in a whole range of different disciplines. And you can see them on the right-hand side of the screen there. So yeah, open research, openness, transparency means different things. In some places, it's pre-registration. In some places, it's really managing and, and being very careful about the positionality and conflicts of interest and commitment that the researchers might have. In other places, other things will apply and be more relevant. But I think there's a huge opportunity for us to work between these disciplines, between these research fields and settings to really learn from each other and, and learn some good practice across the disciplinary areas. So not always the same and not always fully open, but open research as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. So that's a little bit about openness. And I'll say a little bit about how I think changes happen. Um, and for, for what I'm about to talk about, I, I'm extremely grateful to Brian Nozick. Uh, and those of you who know the work of Brian Nozick at the Centre for Open Science are likely to know what kind of slide might be coming next. So this is thinking about how we change in research culture. How do we move? towards uh, greater transparency, rigor, and openness in research. And Brian has, has outlined, and I've sort of extrapolated a little bit from, from the work that he's done, um, you know, we need a basic environment. So researchers need to, it needs to be made possible to be transparent and rigorous and open. So you need the infrastructure, you need the basic infrastructure, you need, you need an internet connection, you know, let this, be honest, that's not ubiquitous in all the world and we shouldn't take it for granted. We need the infrastructure, we need funding and we need time. So these are the basic things simply to make it possible. But we, more than that, we need an enabling environment. So if we're going to do this sort of work, it needs to be easy. It really does need to be easy. And, and that's the next thing that, that needs to be put in place. Workflows, interfaces, training and skills, you know, really make a difference as to whether or not it's easy to do research in this sort of way. And then we move into sort of the range of research culture, if you like, normative uh, expectations, local practices, the sorts of things that communities are, you know, uh, are building. Is it normative? Is it the usual and expected thing for research to be done in this sort of way in your community or in your lab or in your discipline or in your institution? And once those sorts of things are in place, then you might think about making it rewarded. Uh, so make uh, in recruitment, for example, in promotion, in grant funding, you might want to reward the sorts of uh, transparency and rigor and openness that, that we're talking about with respect to, to open research here. And finally, you might make it required. So once all the other things are in place, then you can make it a policy. Uh, of course, that's, that's ideal. In the real world, policy is likely to come in a little sooner than that. Um, but you can understand the logic of, of this sort of way of thinking about things. So one of the things that I've been thinking about with respect to this really, really helpful framework is, you know, different actors in the system, you know, have got strengths in different places within this kind of framework. So, you know, you can think about the ways in which funders and institutions 
provide that basic basic environment. The ways in which institutions and publishers perhaps have got a really strong role in making it easy and providing workflows, interfaces, and so on, and so on. And we can step up and just sort of map out. And this is a very rough sort of mapping, and you can absolutely argue with some of the positions that I might have put particular stakeholders in here. But I think it it does illustrate the helpfulness that this this framework has. But one of the things that really struck me here was look look at the role of institutions. For me, institutions, universities, research institutes, and so on, have got a massive role right across this framework for change. And that's one of the reasons why the UKRN Open Research Programme really focuses on the roles of institutions, because they, you know, right across uh, this change framework, they've got roles to play. So thinking about how we then design the UKRN Open Research Programme, you can see here that throughout this sort of framework, there are interventions. So we're going to work on, an, on the enabling environment, on making it easy through training and, uh, and helping develop skills. We're going to work on communities and community norms through looking about the ways in which local, i.e. institutional uh, practice is shared and improved. We're going to talk about incentives, about recruitment and promotion in particular, and we're going to talk about policy, institutional policies, the ways in which those are, are developed and improved. So I think it's a really helpful framing for the way in which uh, the program has been developed. And so here is how the program looks. Um, it's a, a five-year program running till 2026 at the moment. Uh, it, and it involves around 20 institutions. Uh, I think another one is just in the process of joining. So that will be 21, I think, and a whole range of other partners. I'll talk about those in a minute. But broadly speaking, the strands of the program are an evaluation strand to really assess what the situation is. So what is the extent of open research? What progress are we going to make? How will we know and evidence that? And what requirements can we feed into the rest of the program? And how can we make this a sort of continual learning kind of program? Then there's a training intervention, which is really geared around train the, a train the trainer model to build up institutional capacity to help people develop their skills and training on open research practices so that they can train their peers and others in their institution. And by, uh, by that, I mean both professional services staff and academic staff, depending on the sorts of training that we're talking about. And sharing practice. So this is primarily, but not exclusively, institutional practice. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, for example, reward and recognition in, in recruitment, promotion, and appraisal time, types of processes. And there's, as you might expect, a management and governance strand in the programme. And as you might expect, all of these things are intended to work together in a neat way to produce a coherent programme. So this is the blueprint. This is, you know, more tangibly, I've spoken in sort of quite hand wavy and abstract terms about the programme, but this is quite concretely what we're intending to produce by the end of the programme. And I think this is, this is sort of really helpful. I've tried to pull out in red here some of the things that are, are the key sort of messages we're going to produce a broader and larger range of uh, UKRN communities. So bringing together more researchers, more institutions, more other stakeholders within the UKRN family, if you like, of, of people who are, and institutions and organisations that are committed to greater transparency and rigour. So we're building that kind of community across the UK. And of course, uh, working much more closely with, with our international peers, other reproducibility networks in other countries. Uh, we're going to build a, a sort of a collection, if you like, of training resources. And I'll say a little bit more about the work that we've done in all of this uh, in the second half of the webinar. But so that is that is one of the the, the outputs, a set of training resources that people can use uh, that are open and fair and available for people to use and, and curated. And a cohort of trainers, which is really the heart of, of the training uh, strand of the work. It's this community, this cohort of trainers. That have uh, that have been trained to to be trainers, but are also working within a community and able to sort of draw on each other's skills to to pursue that. Um, a set of materials describing institutional policy. So we're going to try to help institutions share uh, both sort of pre-public and post-public materials around institutional policies, um, and that that's that will be interesting. Uh, we have making a start on that, uh, developing some really interesting methods by which to evidence um, how, we're how we're making a change. Um, so, you know, we, we, we put some really interesting ideas into the 
the bid for this work, things like, can you track the, the sort of changes in people's orchid profiles? Does that is that a thing that we can do? And is you know what would that tell us? Can we can we design some controlled trials of particular sorts of interventions to really get some hard rigorous evidence on on what works in promoting transparent research practices? Um, enhanced capability nationally, uh, so that's building up UKRN and other sort of entities, and a long term sustainable sustainability model for the UK reproducibility network. We can't keep going back to funders and asking for further millions of pounds. That's not a sustainability model. So we do need to work out how UK are on it, if it's going to continue to do work that's valued by its communities, is going to continue to do that. So that's that's the blueprint. That is what we're going to produce by 2026, which is becoming frighteningly close, in fact. So I'm going to pause there because uh, that's lots of the contextual stuff. In the second half, I'll talk a lot more about the more detailed work that we're doing in the program, but I thought it would be useful at this point, uh, and I'll stop sharing, um, to give you the opportunity to ask me some questions or ask each other for some questions. So if you have got questions or comments you'd like to make, please, could you raise your hand? Matthew, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, so you mentioned that um, the industry is, is quite good at kind of doing this monitoring and, and so on internally. Um, is, is the, how can we learn from men about how to do some, some of this stuff? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I certainly think there are places outside of the academic sector that we really ought to be learning from. Um, I mean, some of the ones that spring immediately to mind are some of the standard operating procedures that, that are in place in, in pharmaceutical companies, um, some of the total quality management um, sort of approaches that have been developed in the automobile industry in the sort of 70s and 80s, some of the cultural work that was done in the airline industry to, to make a sort of no blame culture where you know, near misses are reported as a matter of course. Um, and I'm sure there are other examples as well. Uh, some of the work you know, that, that's been done in, in theatre, actually, to sort of um, following the Me Too movement about enabling people to speak up in a safe way. So, you know, I think there are huge opportunities for us to work in exactly the sorts of ways you, you're describing. And I really welcome, you know, pointers to other examples of where we might be looking. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's interesting that you mentioned aviation, because I, I think um, that that was the first thing that, that I thought of when you started talking about not having a blame culture. Um, because it's so ingrained in aviation that that um, it's such a good example of that. <clears throat> and certainly, I think um, the the one the company that comes to mind, just because we happen to have been talking about it recently, is Oxford Instruments, which is kind of um, you know a company which is supporting research as as a technical vendor, as it were, like one of the microscope vendors or something like this. Um, and they say that you know when they're when they're working on something they need to be very good at justifying why they're doing what they're doing. If they have a new idea for a product, then they need to be able to say, okay, this customer really wants this to do this workflow. Um, so I think there's good examples in the uh, in industry that are kind of uh, associated with, with research, not just in completely different fields. That's that's great. And yes, if there's someone with whom we can talk uh, at, at that at Oxford Instruments, we'd be really, really pleased to do that. We're really keen to sort of take these sorts of um, examples and and just explore. You know, we can't just lift and shift into the academic world. Things don't necessarily work in the same way in universities as they do in commercial companies. Of course they don't. But, but you know, there are obviously lessons that we can learn. So, yeah, really happy to pick up conversations and see whether or not there's things that we can learn. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass, on, pass on some details, yeah. Yeah, cheers. Does that ring any bells with anybody else on the call? Ah, Pranali? Uh, hi. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, within open research, uh, we have, uh, so what you mentioned in the slides, it's uh, focusing on more, you know, transparent data and putting out data and having the capability and workflows to do all that. Uh, and but apart from these factors, which would which help in you know uh, reproducibility and like improving things, 
uh, over time is there also uh, within this training a focus on experimental design especially because uh, from other than like open data some of the uh, like and statistical things which we can improve the reliability of experiments is there a focus on incorporating improved experimental design especially in complex systems where there are more variables like especially biology psychology where you know the many of the experiments like many labs or the cancer biology project where they looked at like a lot of variables and so experimental design is there training for that which is included in this plan or not yeah that's a great question thanks um well i'm going to go and talk a little bit about more detail of the the program in a minute um at the moment i think i'd have to say probably not um but <laughs> I mean, the focus is very much on openness and transparency, which is, you know, it's not quite the same as experimental design. Um, you know, they're both absolutely critical, but I will take that away and see whether it fits into the syllabus or the schema that we've been developing um, and see whether or not there is training out there that we can bring into the program uh, and make available to the participants so yeah it's sort of a qualified no at the moment but uh that isn't to say it's not important it's a matter of what the scope of the program is okay um i'd like i mean i kind of uh, discovered ukr in two years ago and i went into what all can be done and one of the things is i looked into experimental design and i would just like to share uh, this book which i found very useful uh, i don't know if you know it's uh, experimental design for Laboratory Biologist by Stanley Lasik, and it actually goes through kind of the statistics and especially sample size and some of these trade-offs which you have to do to improve the, you know, which experiments you can do and how reliable they should be. And so I haven't found as much, as many resources to kind of improve on that side. So I was wondering if uh, this is something which could be incorporated uh, in the open science movement, because there's two cases for the open science, one is like the reproducibility, reproducibility part, which can be just about sharing data and, you know, being transparent and some of the practices uh, which can be more rigorous. But another is just even if you do everything rigorously, which we already know how to do, even then we cannot reproduce. And so the other part I thought was uh, experimental design. And so I just wanted to share that. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Could you put a reference to the book in the chat so that we've all got it? I think that'd be really helpful. Um, and it would be great to see whether you know there is a whole load of uh, training resources out there on this topic that, that, that are openly available. I mean, clearly, our books are useful, but training resources that can be reused are also um, also useful. Uh, Aristoteles. I may have said your name wrong, so I really am sorry. Yeah, hi. Um... That's fine. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, yeah, so hi, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for giving this concise talk on the structure of the program. I want to ask to what extent is it going, to what extent the research integrity can fit into the blueprint that you presented? Because I understand that openness is not necessarily the same as research integrity, but I think like a, a culture that is conducive and training that is conducive to proper research integrity and practices and good practices, it's also may be conducive to open research and transparency. So I wonder how it fits. Yeah, how this fits. no, it's an interesting question. Certainly in the UK, the, the sort of national concord that we have on uh, to support research integrity is based on five principles, one of which is openness tra and transparency. So the, the sort of I guess the framing there is that openness and transparency is one of a number of qualities or principles that contribute to high levels of research integrity. So that's one way of, of thinking about it. But I think, you know, another way of thinking about it is research done with a high level of integrity does have a certain level of transparency. So, you know, I, you know, it, they contribute to each other. And I think that's certainly one of the ways in which we're sort of designing the program. There will, for example, be a, a, as part of the training with tying up with the the virtue initiative which is uh, sort of a virtues ethics type um initiative in in europe 
to uh, to present some or, or to offer some training around sort of virtue ethics and the ways in which you need to think through a, a whole lot of dilemmas, especially, for example, in, in some qualitative uh, social sciences, um, when thinking about what transparency might mean in your research project. So, you know, I think there's lots of ways in which there are connections there. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Protocols.io is actually a partner in the programme, so I think there's, they've got really look forward to working with them on um, providing some of the training. Um, okay, if there's no more questions, I'm slightly nervous that the fan on my laptop is running at 100 miles an hour and is draining the battery at an appalling rate. So I'm going to suggest uh, that we take a sort of five minute, five minute ish break now, uh, while I go and find a power supply, and you go and find a cup of tea. Um, and then we'll come back and I'll speak a little bit more detail about what the program's actually going to comprise and, and, um, and you can get into some of the detail of it. Is that okay? All right. See you back here in, well, it says 13.36 on, on my, um, my clock. So should we say uh, 13.43? See you then. Right, hello. My power supply was about five floors below, so please excuse the slightly out of breath me. Um, thanks for coming back, everyone. Um, my laptop's now a lot happier, and I'm, we can start uh, diving into some of the detail about the program. Um, so let me share my screen, and there'll be a few more slides as we go into a bit more detail. Um, so, this uh, is who the program partners are, this is who the program is. Um, there were 18 institutions initially, two and possibly now three more institutions have joined since. And you can see quite a wide diversity of institutions, um, sports, you know, specialist institutions like the Royal Veterinary College, you know, large um, sort of internationally research known institutions like UCL or Oxford, um, uh, all sorts of institutions. Um, it's funded by Research England, uh, which means that the funding comes from Research England and the funding stays in England. So there are interesting issues around the participation of Scottish and, and Welsh institutions, but they are participating and uh, are full partners in the programme. And you can see lots of uh, centers of expertise of different kinds over on the right hand side there. Largely, they are helping us with delivering the training program, but there are other roles for them as as well. And yes, you can see protocols.io there, they were mentioned earlier in the first half of the, the webinar. Um, so as a reminder, this is the structure of the program. It's built on an evaluation strand. There's a train the trainer strand, uh, a strand around sharing practice and management governance. So that, those are the things that I'm now going to go on to talk about. And you can see a QR code up there for, for the programme if you want to link out to it from the talk. So let's let's step through some of the, the details of, um, of the programme. Um, so, as I say, built on the foundation of evaluation, of learning and adapting. So um, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is our sort of baseline and progress survey. Um, and this started off by uh, being inspired by the brief open research survey, which was led out of Brun Brunel University a year or two ago, uh, and which found uh, a range of open research practices uh, and, and really set sort of what the landscape was. Um, we're building on that and have adapted and, and developed an instrument uh, for a survey now, um, which we're rolling out at the partner institutions at the moment, uh, closes at the end of March. And really the point of this survey is to assess the extent of open research practices across different disciplines, different career stages and so on, um, where researchers look to 
the support and how adequate they find that sort of support for uh, for being open in their research. Um, we're going to combine that with a brief literature review that we're doing at the moment to produce a, a working paper. So that will be a, a, an output, if you like, we hope later, later this year. But the prime, primary reason for doing, or one of the primary reasons for doing that survey at the moment, is that we are keen to understand where the training priorities in the program need to be. So what, where are researchers looking for and not necessarily finding the training support that they need in order to practice open research? Um, we will repeat the survey uh, as a sort of uh, see how far we've got kind of exercise in 2025, maybe, maybe 2026, not quite sure yet, probably only once more. Uh, we know that uh, our sector is not under surveyed, so we don't want to uh, do too many surveys, but I think it's a really useful exercise for us to understand you know, the kind of progress that we might have made over the course of the programme. So that's the survey. It's, I mean, that is focused, I should say, the, the scope of that survey is on 14 open research practices that we sort of develop that typology of 14 from discussions within the UK our own community. And it, so it's not just open research data and code, but it's looking much more broadly at, at other sorts of things, including pre-registration and sort of uh, sharing qualitative data and, and so on. Um, so the other side of the evaluation coin, if you like, is thinking about more specifically the evalu the interventions that we're making, whether that be training or looking at policies and practices and so on, which I'll talk about shortly, but how are we going to evaluate the effectiveness of that and that, that, those sorts of interventions? And, and that's quite tricky, um, especially doing that in a way that you, where you can attribute the effects to the intervention. Um, and we're not underestimating the challenges that that that's going to throw up. We've got a working group looking at that now, and we're drawing from the, the UK government's treasury, the sort of Magenta book, which is the Bible for programme evaluation in the UK. Um, obviously working from the blueprint that I've just described, but also looking at the plans that, that each of the work stream uh, leads have developed and the sorts of impacts that they're intending to have. So we're developing these theories of change um, for each of the work streams training, policy revision, and so on. Um, and going to be quite specific about, you know, what impact are we intending to have? What are our assumptions in thinking about how we will have that impact? What other things might affect that impact and, and so on? So what signals do we need to be looking for when we're assessing what sorts of change or difference has been, been made? Um, and we will be developing a whole set of interesting methodologies, I hope, um, as a part of that. Now, as a sort of parallel strand within that, I wanted to mention some work that we will be doing around open research indicators, and I'm sure this will prompt some questions. So one of the things that we're very aware of is there's quite a lot of work going on in different sorts of places. So PLOS spring to mind, uh, the Charité um, and Quest Centre in Berlin, the uh, Koki unit at Curtin University, uh, the Skolcoms lab work in, in the US, there's quite a lot of work going on around the world to look at what sorts of signals, what sorts of indicators we might have for monitoring aspects of open research that we're particularly interested in. And so one of the things we're going to do, and I'm gonna, we're going to launch this at, at the next UKRM webinar, actually, on the 15th of March. You, you can't register for that yet, but I hope we'll be able to register you next we can get, get the form up for next week. So 15th of March, I can't remember what time it is, probably in the afternoon, we'll be launching um, this strand of work with a, a call for priorities, really, asking um, a whole range of, uh, uh, of stakeholders, asking you, effectively, you know, what should our priorities be when we're thinking about what we want to monitor with respect to open research? Are they the factors influencing you know, how much open research is done? Are, are they the extent of open research? Are there the impacts of openness in research or are they something else? And, and can we be specific about those sorts of things? And the idea here is to start to develop some insight that will help us plan some pilots in UKRN institutions sometime next year. And we've got a group of, I don't know, 10 or 15 institutions that are part of UKRN that are keen to pilot um, sort of indicators of, of open research. Um, so we'll be working with solutions providers, if I can call them that, um, to see whether or not they're interested in engaging 
and helping sort of develop their their work through those sorts of pilots and we can have a quite a, a mutually beneficial learning experience through that kind of prototyping and piloting work now of course we're we're very aware of a lot of the caveats and cautions that you have to have when as soon as you start talking about indicators um and you know we, we have read the metric tide reports and we are aware of uh, those sorts of issues so uh, we will be very much um, paying attention to those as, as we develop the work. So I've talked a lot about training uh, and training is a big, big part of the program. It's a train the trainer model. So what we're trying to do here is to develop the capacity that institutions have uh, to, to, to train researchers. And that capacity might be in the form of other researchers, it might be in the, the form of professional services staff, and of course increasingly there are, there are sort of people who, who straddle both of those categories, uh, and the more that in a sense we can corrode that boundary, the better in, in lots of ways. Um, so it's a train the trainer model, that's both to enable sustainability, so these, you know, these community of trainers will sustain after the funding is gone, but also scalability. We can't possibly train 160,000 researchers or, or however many it is in, in UK universities, um, but we can train a cohort of trainers that can go on and, and make a, a sizable difference in their institutions. So what we've done so far is we have surveyed uh, the leaders in our partner institutions trying to assess two things really. One, what are their priorities? What do they think with respect to open research our training priorities ought to be? And secondly, what training resources do they have at their institutions and use? Uh, and this was work that was led by Keele University last year. Very grateful to them for that piece of work. And it's threw up some really interesting findings that we're going to publish as soon as we possibly can. Uh, and I hope this is in the next days or weeks, although it's not me doing it, so I, I really shouldn't impose that on um, whoever it is. Um, we're going to publish a working paper on that. And, and some of the interesting findings were so there were quite a lot of training resources out there but interestingly that you know these are training resources around open research only about 10 percent of those resources were in fact open so the training resources the openness of the training resources themselves is is an issue now you know i, I don't suppose for a moment this is institutions deliberately hiding resources it's just that it's not necessarily something that we think about um, but there's a huge, huge opportunity there, I think, for the programme to, to make a difference. Um, because once we start sharing those sorts of resources, then we can start uh, making them better, making them more consistent, and, you know, developing better practice. Um, so that's what's been done, you know, in... That's a big part of what's been done so far. We've also been working, and this is led by Sheffield, we've... Uh, this whole actually strand of work is, is led by Sheffield at the moment. Um, we've developed a, a schema or a syllabus. So drawing from that survey, we've outlined a, a set of either 20 or 30 priorities for, for the training. And we're hoping that we'll be able to release that. I hope it's gone out to, I think it's gone out to program partners already, but it's, it should go out publicly very, very soon. And it, it shows sort of what the priorities were and the sorts of offers we may be able to make given the program partners that we have, but it's version one. And the survey that I talked about earlier um, of researchers and their open research practices is going to inform version two. So we expect this to iterate and change over the course of the program, uh, and we will adapt the training offer accordingly. But we need to get started, and so we're going to issue version one and, um, and put out some training reasonably soon. I think the first the first item of training, if you like, the first training offer should be in, in June. So please look out for that. We're also, and this is again led by Sheffield with, with uh, Oxford Brooks and, and Newcastle and others, uh, developing approaches to accreditation for trainers and validation for the resources. So how can we be sure that the resources are, are good? You know, we talked about a curated collection of resources. Well, what does that curation comprise? And also, you know, can we, what, what would it mean for us to accredit trainers and who is us in that sentence so there's some good thinking going on about that what would really encourage trainers to step forward and what would be valuable for them in terms of accreditation in terms of their career development and so on 
And, you know, just to get us started, we're piloting a set of five open research train the trainer workshops in four universities, actually in the West Country, so Bath, Bristol, Exeter, and Cardiff, um, on pre registration, open access, open data code, and preprints. So those are happening over the next two or three months. Um, and they may well feature in the wider sort of program of train the trainer in, in due course. So that's where we are on training. Recognition and reward, I'm going to move on to now. So this is how primarily do institutions recognize, reward, uh, and to an extent resource, but certainly recognize and reward um, the work that people do, a whole range of different people do, to, to make research open and transparent. And this is in, for example, recruitment procedures, uh, job descriptions, criteria, and so on, promotion frameworks, criteria, uh, the sorts of examples that are given in promotion frameworks, appraisal procedures, and so on. So those are the sorts of things that we're looking at as intervention points. Now, of course, we know that there's a huge amount of work going on in reforming research assessment. We can talk about the European initiative, the, the COARA uh, agreement, and so on. We can talk about DORA and the Leiden Manifesto. We can talk about many, many things that are going on. It's very crowded space, uh, not all of which is talking about recognizing and rewarding open research. It's about trying to reform research assessment across the board to make it fairer and more reliable and just better, really. So one of the first things we've done is to form an international advisory group for this particular piece of work, because there is so much going on, it would be so easy to duplicate or cut across or do something incompatible with some of the work that's going on out there. So we formed an international advisory group, it's got people from DORA and COARA and, and Leiden and, and, and so on, on it. Um, so we're reasonably confident that, that group's well engaged and is going to make sure that the work we do adds value, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't cut across other things that are going on or duplicate things. So what's been going on so far is that we've we've formed that, we've developed a, a plan, we've we've undertaken or just finalising a landscape review so that we've got a really clear sense of what that landscape looks like. And um, I might need to discuss this with the working group that's led by Cardiff University actually on, on this about whether or not we can then turn that into a, a UKRN working paper. I think that would be great to have that out reasonably soon. I think people would find that a really useful thing to look at. But the main sort of outputs of this part, piece of work are a set of, if you like, management tools to help institutions uh, improve the ways in which they recognize and reward open research in the context, of course, of them reforming recognition and reward more generally, almost certainly. So we're thinking about a maturity framework. How can we think about better recognition and reward? What does better look like in different disciplines, field settings, methods of research and so on for different kinds of uh, staff, whether those are research, research associated, uh, professional, technical and so on. Uh, a self-assessment toolkit. So how can institutions check where they are now and where they'd like to get to and what the steps are between those two and some guidance and some training. So one of the priorities, interestingly, that came out of that uh, survey that I mentioned of training priorities um, uh, that was done last year was one of the priorities is for institutions to be better able uh, and trained in exactly this sort of thing. Exactly how, how do you design, build and run a, a better recognition and reward system? So, you know, and embed incentives in, in the right sorts of ways. So that nicely comes together with the work that this this working group is doing and we're going to test these these management tools in in a few case studies so we're hoping and expecting some of the institutions that are partners in the program to step forward as being case studies where we can test and really kick the tires of these management tools and check that they are what they claim to be they do what they claim to do and to change and revise them and, and make sure that they're as good as they can be in a diverse range of institutions. So they're maximally uh, useful. That's reward and, and recognition. Uh, and the final strand of the program is around sharing policies and, and practice. And so there's, there's quite a lot in this. It, it, um, the first thing that we've done, and I'm grateful to, to the University of Reading for leading uh, this part of the work, is to develop what we call this version one of a living website. Now we promised a living website without necessarily defining it. Uh, when we, um, so that's part of the work that we're doing is to define what we mean by a living website. But certainly phase one of that 
is a set of pages for each of the institutional partners. So each of the universities and institutions are the partners in the program have got a page on, on the UKRM website and you can go and have a look at those that just sets out what do they currently do? What statements have they made around open and transparent research? You know, what uh, training do they offer and guidance do they offer to their researchers? Um, how does that fit with their research integrity and ethics and so on? And what, what other things do they do? Do they support reproducibilities or riot uh, science or, or other sorts of activities? So just setting all that out in a, in a reasonably consistent way on a set of web pages for each of those institutions so that you, know, you can look and you can see what the University of Surrey does and you can see what the University of Reading and, and, and Newcastle University and others are doing and you can draw lessons from them and you can see, you know, um, um, you know uh, well, yes, you, you, can, you can draw lessons from the way that it's been done in, in other institutions and, you know, hopefully that encourages a you know, certain amount of, can I say, healthy competition, a certain amount of wanting to put your best sort of page forward, as it were. Um, but version two, we hope, will be a lot more dynamic and inclusive, uh, a lot more structured, probably, and, and maybe have some areas that are closed so that the partners in the program, the institutional partners in the program, have all signed a, an agreement to be part of the program, which includes a confidentiality clause. So what we would like to be able to do on the basis of that is enable them to share early versions, for example, of draft policies or draft sort of codes of practice or guidance or whatever it is among this closed and sort of high trust community so that we can work together to, to make those better, to make them more consistent and to learn from each other to, to make sure that we're, we as a group of institutions are doing the best we can to support a, an environment that, that promotes rigorous and transparent research and, and clearly being able to, to demonstrate that sort of environment may well be very useful in future research assessment uh, exercises. So those are the sorts of things that we're doing around the living website. There is other work going on in this strand that we're sort of trying to sort of do in various forms. Earlier this week, um, I, along with a colleague at JISC, uh, convened a, a round table with professional and technical services staff. It's always seemed to me that professional and technical services staff uh, play an absolutely critical role in open research. Um, and, you know, that's that's absolutely obvious with respect to research managers and librarians uh, and research software engineers, but it's not necessarily quite so obvious with respect to marketing professionals or finance or legal professionals. Um, so we wanted to just explore those sorts of uh, contributions. So we've got national representatives of, of about 20, 25 different professions, I guess. In a room, uh, we've developed a whole set of materials. We're drafting a report from that now, and we hope that that will be the start of a conversation that enables, you know, those professions both to, to talk with each other, talk within those communities, talk across those communities, and to talk with other communities such as you know academic research communities of different kinds, to to see what what does good professional technical services um, support for open research really look like. Um, and how can we how can we sort of make improvements to that and um, and share share good practice? So that's been quite important. Another thing I'll just flag at the moment is that we just we haven't quite started yet, but we we intend to get started on a, a project that's brought together maybe a dozen or so institutions sharing some of their funds actually some of their additional resources in, in, in research in England there's some of their research England research culture funding for example to look at how have institutions implemented the open research data concordat now that was signed in 2016 uh, by universities UK on behalf of the, the sector and by well as it was then Hefke and, and research councils UK and, and welcome on behalf of the funders and it set out a whole range of expectations that funders and employers would have and researchers would have about implementing open research data now, obviously, quite a lot of time has gone by since 2016, and there have been efforts to implement those commitments over time. But we know that the policy landscape is, is going to, to change around open research data. Um, we know that you know, there is going to be attention on the ways in which you know, the sorts of expectations that are placed on the sector with respect to 
sharing open research data. And so it's timely now, I think, for us as a group of institutions to come together and try and learn some lessons. How has it been implementing the open research data concord without you know, naming and shaming and, and making clear who's done what? But in general terms, what have we found difficult? What have we found OK? And what would we like to feed into any sort of uh, reviews or attention to, to, data, uh, to, to policies in this sort of area. So there's work gonna, I hope, go on over the next year or so that's gonna explore that. We're developing a toolkit for institutions uh, sharing practice globally this time. I mentioned the UNESCO Open Science recommendation earlier uh, and you know just, just how much I think it's an, an excellent thing. So institutions globally will be implementing that recommendation and so we are building on work that was initially done by Reading actually for the UK reproducibility network to develop a checklist to help institutions sort of develop an implementation plan for open research and UNESCO saw that they liked it and they asked us can you develop that now to be globally relevant and to be relevant right across the the range of the UK the, the UNESCO open science recommendation and can you make it five pages long? So that's that's a challenge uh, that we've we've decided to pick up, uh, supported by the, financially by universities of Bristol and, and Reading and, and Zurich as, as well. And we will be developing over the course of the next six months or so a, a toolkit with a set of uh, sort of supporting materials to help institutions around the world, but in you know, including in the UK, implement that open science recommendation. And finally, on this slide, I'll just mention, because I did point out, pointed out in the sort of blueprint, if, as it were, that, that the sustainability model for UKRN itself is, is an output from this programme. So we've started thinking about what, a, what the value proposition is for UKRN for institutions in particular. So what value do, does or should UKRN uh, have for, for institutions? And we'll be talking about that with our institutional leads in a couple of weeks time when we we all come together as a group of institutions to have that that conversation so that's the program this is the last substantial slide um and it's how you might get involved and i've done this in a little i guess there's an implied flow chart here so how to get involved slightly depends on where you are um so is your institution part of the program well, if you go to that link, you can see which institutions are part of the programme. If it is part of the programme, then please contact your institutional lead, and you can see institutional leads listed on the UKRN website, or your programme contact, uh, which will be listed on the, that partner institutions page, um, or your UKRN local network lead, all of whom will be able to say um, how you might get involved. And we really are keen to get involved. You have seen the breadth of work that's going on. Um, all of that work is being done and led by institutions. It's not being led by me, it's being led by institutions that are part of the programme. And we're very keen to bring in more expertise, a huge amount of expertise across the institutions that are part of the programme. So if you're keen to get involved, we're really, really going to welcome you. So please, if there's parts of the work that you've, you've heard about today that you're keen to get involved and your, your institution is part of the programme, then please get in touch. Very keen to have you as part of, part of the programme. If you're not, if your institution isn't part of the programme, but it might still be an institutional member of UKRN, just not quite joined the programme yet, and you can have a look um, at that page and, and see whether that's the case. Well, if that's the case, then, then have a chat with your UKRN institutional lead and, and see whether or not they're interested in, in your institution joining the programme. It's a very small, well, it's a relatively small step to take in some ways, and I would argue there's quite a lot of benefits to them in doing so. And if your institution isn't hasn't got sort of institutional member membership of of UKRN, then maybe you want to discuss with your UKRN local network lead, and you can see the local network leads on the UKRN website. How how you might work together with them to make a case for your institution to become an institutional member of UKRN and thereby join the program and and enjoy some of the benefits and opportunities to participate that I've just mentioned. And if you're not from an institution. If you're not from a UK institution, if you're from a commercial company, if you're from a publisher, if you're from a funder, if you've got any other sort of contributions that you might want to make or engagements you might want to make in the programme, please email me. We're really, really keen to talk, collaborate. Uh, that's the whole ethos of UKRN. It's collaborating. Um, so, yeah, please do get in touch. We're very keen to talk to you. 
So at that point, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, very hopeful that if I give you a minute or two to digest some of that, you might have some comments or questions. Samantha. Hello. Um, I know it's kind of coming, but could you give us a bit more kind of a rough idea of, of kind of the, the training and, and what you envision that is? Because that, that's my job is, is working out. Um, I'm a research and computing training lead person. So. Ah, um, now, I, so, well, so I think it's going to, while Adam may join us, I think it's going to take a variety of, of forms, to be honest, um, depending on the subject and depending on the um, sort of audience. Uh, so, you know, in, in some cases, it's going to simply be delivered by training partners. So we've got, for example, Project Tier uh, and the sort of um, is an example where that that is a protocol for properly documenting and version control um, research as it's done and how then you you inculcate those sorts of skills to undergraduates when you're lecturing them so it's about how do you yeah engage undergraduates in that sort of skill set uh, um, in the lecturing and, and uh, teaching that you do so we hope that will be one of the early um early sort of items of training that the sun and, and that would simply be those people coming over from the states they're based in the states and delivering that as a sort of two or three day workshop and they'll do that repeatedly through the life of the program as you know more people become interested in in that uh, and there'll be a few of a few examples like that um i think there'll also be examples where it will be um a lot more about enabling people to pull together resources to design their own workshops training workshops and so uh, there's work to be done to, to sort of see see what that looks like um so that's a bit of a vague and waffly answer i'm afraid Samantha. Uh, it's, but i think that's sort of where we are at the moment unless adam's going to leap to my rescue which is not no that's fine it's just that you know i've been a carpentry's instructor for a while um my, yeah. my job is 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 training and um yeah we're looking at planning some data data stewardship stewardship stuff at ucl anyway because we know we've got a gap in that side of things so you know we've got the the notebooks we've got you know all the policies but actually some of the mechanics and managing stuff around it is where we've got kind of okay so one of the things gaps. i could one of the things i could say about that so the software sustainability institute is a partner in the program um, and one of the things that we've asked them to do, or in the process of asking them to do, is to um, to uh, develop a, a sort of carpentries-like course specifically for open research. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, we hope, will be available. It will take them a few months to develop that, um, but I hope it will be available perhaps in a, in a year or so's time. In the meantime, I've been having conversations with them about whether or not we can get sort of just simply offer seats uh, to develop more sort of carpentries instructors over the over the sector as well. Um, but yeah, so that I think that's where we are on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we, we've had a number of, of SSI fellows and we've currently got one in the knee crop. So yeah, in one of our RSCs. So yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. Any other any other questions about the? I mean, the, there was a fair amount in the last half hour, so you might want a moment or two to digest it. I guess. Yeah. Interesting point from John in the chat about PhD training. Um, John, do do you want to expand on that? Um. Hi. Uh, just to say that you mentioned materials around hiring and promotion and so on, but I think it's also possible to think about how students, PhD students are supported, uh, both from what they do and also how examiners look at and think about the work that they do. You know, just from the principle that open research can take time, that that can have consequences for what examiners can expect and what they can look towards in terms of evaluation and rewards. 
Um, and there are some resources uh, that uh, my own institution, we developed some materials for examiners. And I know I'd pass that on to, to, to Marcus at UKRN. At one point, we had discussions with University of Hertfordshire. And, I, I, you know, our stuff isn't necessarily by any means the best. It was really just that we can think about this at, at other levels than you had on your slide. That was all. And I think starting early is a good thing in principle. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Thanks. And I certainly think there are ways in which we can engage with doctoral training colleges and programmes in exactly that sort of way. So I'll have a chat with Marcus about the materials you shared with him, John, and see whether or not we can build out from, from those. I think that's that's a great idea. Thank you. Matthew. Yeah, so we were talking about incentives in the context of the um, kind of academic side of things and the research group side of things. But I'm just thinking about um, kind of the, the facility and the, the technical um, staff and, and and how you encourage people in, in that area to, to do things and what incentives you can give. Um, what incentives there could be uh, in that context, because um, I think that there's there's, uh, there's a lot of demands on um, the time of, of people in the in, in facilities to um, deal with lots and lots of things at once. So having this added on as well, while I think we should be doing it, uh, is going to be really challenging um, in that context. So yeah. I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think it's it's a potential problem there. And um, whether that's any more of a challenge than the research groups, I, I don't know. But um, for me, incorporating that into my kind of day to day work is 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 going to be a challenge. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a, a good point. Well made, Matthew. Um, and, you know, we came up at the round table that I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier on. Um, I mean, I suppose one point that was made at that workshop, which is, which I think is is helpful and true, is, you know, to what extent is the work that we're talking about done by professional and technical services staff and facilities staff? To what extent is that specifically about the research being made open, and, and to what extent is it it's simply about the research being well done, well designed, properly documented, properly version controlled? You know, you know all all those sorts of good things that you would expect research to be anyway regardless of whether or not, you know, if I can put it this way, the, the switch is then flicked for it to be made open. You've unmuted, so I think you want to come back on that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's an interesting question. And, and actually, um, for a facility where you're working with several research groups, potentially, um, it, it's almost more important because um, you need to keep track of things. Um, and you need to keep track of things over multiple research groups, and, and there might be um, conflicting interests that might be kind of you might want to compartmentalize things where one research group is something very sim doing something very similar to another research group so how open do you want that to be between those two research groups um, and all of the kind of research data management and and, um, and, and so on um, is is um, particularly important in that context um, like things like archiving and, and and so on which you know a single research group might not worry about so much but if you're a service then uh, and you're saying that you're archiving stuff you need to have really robust uh, infrastructure in place to be able to do that um, yeah. so and and yet there actually seems to be less resource um directed at those facilities than there are in, in, in the search group yeah a whole range of, of really uh, really good points there there Matthew and of course that relates to the point you made earlier about learning lessons from from industry as, as well um, because some of the ways in which that that work is invested in is in, in industry is 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 useful models um I think there are there are some really interesting conversations and models being developed about how some of that that works, for example, of research software engineers is is funded and financed in institutions. There are different sort of organization and financial models for that, whether it's sort of central service or whether it's included in grants as um, you know, specific cost or, or whatever. I think there's useful work that can be done to look at that. But I think we need to engage with funders as well, because clearly, um, you know, if we're we're talking about something that is basically a piece of infrastructure broadly defined then that isn't something that requires project funding that's something that needs to be put on a, a different sort of footing um and of course in some some places it is 
um, if, if you look at some of the national facilities and so on, but in many places it's not. Um, Judith, did you want to come in? Um, yeah, this is just a quick question, and you might not know any more, but you mentioned that there was going to be a review of the Open Re Research Data Concordat. Oh, I'm not sure I quite said that. Well, did you say that we're going to look I was, at I was, they used much more weasel words than that, I think. Did you? <laughs> yes. Um, so I think there's going to be uh, increased attention on right. research data policy. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, we, well, we know that there's a review going on of the whole of the sort of Concordat's landscape, if you like, uh, right. and phase phase one of that reported, I think, last year, that was commissioned out of UKRI, but was combined with Guild HE and University of UK, was it? Um, and phase two is underway at the moment. So we know that whole sort of landscape around Concordats is, is something that people are paying attention to because, you know, they've grown up organically in lots of ways and, and introduced various sorts of expectations in ways that are not necessarily consistent and are quite difficult for institutions to handle because they're coming from different places in different ways. Um, and so the, the research data Concordat is a part of that. But I also, I would also expect um you know national bodies to be thinking quite carefully about ha having having developed sort of policies around open access you would expect possibly a move in the direction of open data and software to follow yeah. that fairly logically yeah that makes sense oh, thank you any other thoughts or questions for me for each other I'm aware that there's um, there's not quite, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, intentions and plans and not quite enough for you to be able to necessarily get your teeth into. I'm hoping in six months time, maybe, or maybe a little more, we might do another one of these and there'll be much more in terms of output for you to get your teeth into. Uh, so maybe we'll come back and and have another conversation then. Okay. If if that really is it, then I will say thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Will, for uh, um, making all the arrangements to make this this happen, uh, and for making all of these webinars happen. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again in some form very soon. Please watch out for the website for updates. Take care. Thank you.